Back in the 80s and 90s of Formula 1, Ayrton Senna was regarded by many to be the best Grand Prix driver in the world. Three world titles, 41 wins, 65 pole positions, and some of the most misused quotes in all of motor racing history. Over one lap, few could match him, and his title of the greatest qualifier of all time has got a pretty good argument going for it. But after leaving McLaren at the end of 1993, Ayrton made mention of another driver that he thought had great future potential, saying, if you think that I'm fast, just wait till you see my nephew Bruno. Well, years later, this guy did end up making it onto the Formula 1 grid and went on to have a long and successful career in the top flight of motorsport. Except long and successful aren't the two words I would use to describe this guy's Formula 1 career. Although when it comes to word association, there are worse combinations for this lad, like Istanbul and dog. But without wishing to induce any more PTSD episodes, I guess I better dig into this and tell y'all the story of Bruno Senna. Born in Sao Paulo, Brazil, Bruno's first experience of driving came about in go-karts on the family farm. And as mentioned before, Ayrton held him to a high regard talent-wise. He taught him all he could about the ins and outs of motor racing, which would have been useful for a fruitful career in motorsport. The former world motor racing champion Ayrton Senna has been pronounced clinically dead after Ayrton's death during the San Marino Grand Prix, Bruno's own racing career was brought to a sudden end over family fears of safety in the sport, having never raced anything outside of the family farm. Years later, however, Bruno had an itch to scratch, and with the support of his family, would begin his own venture into racing. In 2004, Senna would make his car racing debut in the British Formula BMW series, driving with Carlin. He produced some meh results, but this was merely a warm-up heading into the 2005 season, when he would graduate to the British F3 series, driving with double R racing alongside Dan Clark, Senna really, really struggled. Finishing P10 with one pole position to his name, as well as three podiums, doesn't sound too bad, although teammate Clark performed significantly better, finishing P5 in the overall standings. However, having been out of a cockpit for 10 years, it's kind of understandable for him to still be finding his feet. And in 2006, it seemed like things were starting to come good. At the Australian Grand Prix, Senna dominated the Formula 3 support class, winning two out of the three races that weekend. His second season of British F3 started off in fine style, taking pole position in the opening round, and winning the first three races. However, while he would win two more races that year, and would finish third in the standings, his teammate Mike Conway would win the championship after a dominant display. Still though, it was a decent beginning, and progression up the motor racing ranks was only logical. For 2007, Senna would move over to the GP2 series, driving with Arden. He was now lodging a serious claim for a Formula 1 seat. Things looked up again, with Senna taking his maiden GP2 win in just his third race. Decent performances for the remainder of the year saw him finish eight overall and was miles ahead of his teammate Adrian Zalk, who would launch another assault at the GP2 crown in 2008, this time driving with iSport alongside Karun Chandok. <laughs> Laugh all you want, but Karun has won two GP2 races, which is a couple more than pretty much most of us knuckle dragon, mouth breathing couch potatoes have done. Having secured six podiums that year, including a win at Monaco, Senna finished second overall that year. And by this stage, Formula One was very much on the cards. Was he setting the motor racing world on fire? I mean, not really. But he was by no means a slow driver. After testing for Honda at the end of 2008, there was an open door for him to join the team come 2009. But after Honda decided to pull out of the sport for the 11th millionth time, this cast doubt over the future of Senna and of the team itself. However, after Ross Braun purchased the team and a million pieces somehow falling together, there was potential for Senna to make his Grand Prix debut with Braun GP. Now, hindsight is 2020, but still, Imagine. Ultimately, countryman Rubens Barrichello got the nod for the seat, leaving Senna out in the cold. The reason for this was because Braun wanted a driver with experience in that seat, and Senna had nada. But this didn't necessarily mean his Formula 1 dreams were over, with four new teams, which became three after the USF1 project aged like a dead dog in the sun, expressing interest in the 2010 season. He opted against signing with Mercedes and DTM for 2009, in favour of pursuing his dream of becoming a Formula 1 driver. He turned down a potential opportunity with Lotus, and so eventually, look toward Campos Meta, ultimately to be known as Hispania Racing or HRT. On October 30th, 2009, Campos announced Senna as their first driver for the 2010 season. The Senna name was officially back on the Formula 1 grid. The only problem is, this is HRT we're talking about. The prospect of him potentially driving for Braun the previous season is a little ironic, because Hispania Racing would ultimately turn out to be one of the worst Formula 1 teams in recent times. The team was in constant financial worry, completed no pre-season testing, and turned up to the first round in Bahrain running their display cars, with the aim being just to qualify for the bloody race. These guys going up against the likes of Ferrari, McLaren, and Red Bull was like putting Woody Allen in an octagon with Francis Ngannou. Only difference is, Woody Allen would deserve what came 
game to him. But the drivers at HRT didn't really deserve that shit. In Q1 of the Bahrain Grand Prix, the fastest time laid down was a 154.612 by Senor Eyebrows. Senna, the fastest of the HRT cars, set a time of 2 minutes, 3.24 seconds. That immense pace deficit would have seen him lapped numerous times, although on lap 18, his engine was cooked. Not in a good way though. For the remainder of that year, Senna did pretty much all that he could, out qualifying his teammates more often than not. Although out qualifying Saka Yamamoto is like beating the Pittsburgh Pirates. Big freaking deal. By the end of the season, however, he would be dumped from the team, leaving him without a drive, heading into the 2011 season. He did pick up a reserve driver role at Lotus Renault, although with Nick Heidfeld and Vitaly Petrov at the helm of the cars, and with both having gotten podiums earlier that year, there was no way they were going to change the lineup, right? Well, yeah, what do you think happened? Yeah, you Dora the Explorer, that sh didn't you? Come late August, it was announced that Senna would replace Heidfeld from the Belgian Grand Prix onwards. A pretty harsh deal for Heidfeld, but, I mean, come on. This is Bruno Senna do Brasil. He'll now have an opportunity to prove his worth, right? Well, straight out of the gate, he qualified seventh in his first race with the team, ahead of teammate Petrov and two-time world champion Senor Eyebrows. So as long as he gets a decent start and keeps out of trouble, points are plenty were on offer. Yeah, nah, he f***ed it. No, no, no. He would achieve his first points finish two weeks later at Monza, although for the remainder of that year, Senna struggled to keep up with Petrov. And by the end of the year, he was shafted from Lotus, who opted for a new driver lineup in Kimi Raikkonen and Romain Grosjean. Which went well. For 2012, Senna was in need of a drive, and he was offered a lifeline at the Williams Grand Prix team, the team that his uncle raced for at the time of his death. Signing for the team that season, Senna would be partnering Pastor Maldonado. Now, aside from Maldonado having the temperament of a wet cat, his contract also dictated that he would not vacate that car in any FP1 session that year. And because Valtteri Bottas was being groomed for that Williams seat in 2013, Senna had to lie down in 15 FP1 sessions that year. That kind of put him in the back foot, but in fairness, Maldonado drove unbelievably well that year when he wasn't being himself. But it was because of this violent tendency to smash into things that Maldonado only achieved five points finishes that year. Senna achieved double that, also scoring the fastest lap at the Belgian Grand Prix and had standout performances at the Malaysian and Hungarian Grand Prix. The progression that he had made from his first stint with Lotus was pretty noticeable, but for Williams or any other team on that grid for that matter, it wasn't enough. After leaving Formula 1, Senna went on to race primarily in the Formula E and World Endurance Championship championships, achieving quite a bit of success in the latter. But why have I even brought up Bruno's career then, after barely two full years in the game and the best race result of P6? Is this even worth making a video on? Well really, Bruno's career is a big case of what if. What if Ayrton hadn't died that day in 1994? Would he have continued to race in karts during his childhood? Would that have led to a development of racing skills at a young age? Would he have entered racing cars earlier? Would this have set him up for Formula 1 easier? Would he have been a better driver than he already was? It puts an exclamation mark on the importance of racing at a young age. But to achieve what he did, having started racing in the junior ranks at age 21, it's nothing to scoff at. His last name had people expecting the world of him. But you should never expect that, no matter which driver it is. No, Bruno is no Ayrton. Regardless, Bruno had his own success in motorsport. He did win championships. He did win races. He did make it to Formula 1. But then even when he did get to Formula 1, what if he had gotten the nod for that Braun GP seat over Rubens Barrichello? Could he have won races that season and potentially challenged Jensen Button for the championship? And could these better results have led to better drives later on in his career? F, F, F. F1 is F spelled backwards. But when all's said and done, when you watch him drive his uncle's McLaren that he used to win the 1988 World Drivers' Championship with, it's a feel-good moment. To Bruno, Ayrton was his idol. To Ayrton, Bruno was a prodigy. To everyone else that day at Interlagos, they were both of them heroes. Anyways, thank you all for watching, drop a comment below, subscribe to the channel if you're awesome, and always remember, keep it respectful, be wholesome, don't be a manus, and as always, I'll see you all later.